one of my favorite things about the editor, triggers and impulses. Knowing these tools is going to be really important if you want to take your building to the next level. Understanding triggers and using them with events, operators, data sources, and filters is really going to open up the possibilities of what you can do with the rising editor. First, let's discuss how triggers work. A trigger's function is to produce an impulse. It is sent along to an event or filter which have various actions that they perform. The impulse is basically the message that tells the event or filter to perform its own action. The impulse can be passed along through events and filters, allowing you to create a chain of events all activated by one trigger. For example, we're using a basic effect event to set off an explosion. In the next lesson, we'll discuss events in more detail, but for now, I've just placed an effect event here and pointed it to an explosion effect. Now the effect event knows it's supposed to set off an explosion effect, but it doesn't know when. Now's when we need a trigger. Now let's go to Tools, Triggers and Events, and the submenu Triggers. Now let's start with the Area Trigger. This trigger activates when the bike, router, or any other object of your choice enters the area trigger's boundaries. Let's spawn one in the game world and check out its properties. It can have physics applied to it, so these first few options are once again familiar. Scroll down to Shape. By default, the area trigger is a cube, but you can change it to another shape in this slider. By setting the shape to rectangle, you can size it up to a larger area, but not take up a lot of space in the game, so you don't block so much of your view when you're building. Also, you can get more precise in adjusting when the object hits the area trigger. Trigger by is where you select what sets off the trigger. By default, it's set to the bike and rider. But in this menu, we have a few more options. Type determines how it uses the items you choose. Include means the items checked will set off the trigger. Exclude means the items selected will not set off the trigger. Bike, rider, and ground are all obvious. Dynamic objects are any objects that have physics activated. And static objects are objects without physics. Object Instance gives you a cursor to choose any object or objects that you like. These will be specific objects that set off the trigger. When you use Select Object Type, objects the same type as the selected object will set off the trigger. Like if you select a barrel, any barrel like this one will set off the trigger. Next we have Hit Tolerance. This option determines how sensitive the trigger is and how quickly the trigger deactivates when an object stops touching it. It comes in more handy working with hit triggers, so we'll talk more about this in a moment. On hit is the main thing we want to set up in this tool. This is where the impulse is sent when the trigger is activated. For this example, we will connect this to our effect event to set off the explosion. You notice the red arrow is now connecting the trigger to the event. This represents the impulse and the direction that is traveling. This looks basic now, but it will come in handy when you have long chains of events and are trying to find a problem. Disable after hit determines if the trigger can be used more than once. If this box is checked, that means after the trigger is set off once, it will not be able to be used again, unless the router resets the checkpoint or it's reset with a state event, which we'll cover in later lessons. Advanced events lets you get a little more detailed with the trigger's behavior. This menu gives you a choice of sending out more impulses instead of just one. Keep in mind, disable after hit needs to be unchecked for these advanced events to work. For animations in Rising to work, they need constant impulses sent to the events. So for this example, I've set up a rotating board to show you the active and inactive options. The on hit and on leave are set to the explosion events here. Don't worry, we'll talk more about rotating boards in the object position event tutorial later in the series. On hit sends one impulse when you hit or enter the area. On active means it will send a constant 60 impulses per second while you are in the area and stop when you leave the area. You see, the board is rotating because we are sending constant impulses to the events making it move. On leave will send one impulse when you leave the area. On inactive will start sending a constant 60 impulses per second as long as you are not in the area. Once again, you see the board is rotating because we are sending constant impulses to the events making it move. When you enter the area, it will stop and start again when you leave the area. When using these features, you don't have to use all the options. So if you just want to use on leave when the target leaves the area, you can come here and select that impulse target. Once again, remember you need to have disable after hit unchecked or it will only send one hit impulse. Reset at checkpoint restart is pretty much self-explanatory. Uncheck this option if you don't want the area trigger to reset when the router resets a checkpoint. Next we have Hit Trigger. This trigger activates when two items collide. Let's spawn one in the editor and open up the properties. 
The first thing we need to set up is the hitting objects 1 and 2. This menu has options basically the same as the area trigger. For this example, we want the explosion to go off when the bike hits the ground. So we'll set the hitting objects 1 menu to the bike. In the hitting objects 2 menu, we'll select the ground. Now we will set the on hit impulse to go to the effect event and give it a quick test. Before we move on, let's talk a bit more about hit tolerance. Say we want to make the explosion go off when we leave the ground instead of when we touch the ground. Let's break the connection we have with the on hit by hitting the square button and go to the advanced events and point the on leave impulse to the effect event. Remember to uncheck disable after hit. Now, if the bike leaves the ground for a moment, it will set off the explosion. This is with the hit tolerance set to 1. Now, if we bring that number up higher, the bike will have to be off the ground for a longer period of time before the impulse is sent. Now, let's talk about the interval trigger. Instead of using objects in the world, the interval trigger is based on time. Let's open up the properties menu and see how this puppy works. First is start countdown state. This dictates when the tool will start to activate. For this example, once again, we'll use our rotating board to show you how each setting works. Don't worry about how this is set up yet. We'll cover this in later tutorials. I've also added one second to the countdown delay and track properties. This will show you what each setting does. To test this, we'll do a hard restart by pressing down on the right stick or R3. After start, starts when the rider starts. Before countdown activates as soon as the track loads. It will start running as soon as your track fades in from black. On full restart, starts after the countdown delay is complete. Or on a checkpoint restart. You see, after the fade in from black, we had a one second countdown delay and then the board started rotating. And at one second from the 3 to 1 does exactly that. Starts at number 1 in the countdown. We'll talk more about this in the data sources lesson later in the series. Next we have start tick. This is based on the game clock and determines when the trigger will send its first impulse. By default it's set to zero, so if this trigger is enabled it will immediately send an impulse when the game clock starts running. A tick is the smallest unit of time measurement in the game. There are 60 ticks per second. You'll notice if we start increasing the ticks the number directly below the tick represents the time equivalent. Next is interval. This determines how often the trigger will send an impulse. By default, it's set to one second, so every second the trigger will send an impulse. Reset and checkpoint restart will roll the counter back to zero when the router resets a checkpoint. Reset when enabled will reset the counter if the trigger is toggled from disabled to enabled. When the trigger is disabled, the tick counter will start at the start of the game. You can use this option to make it start counting later. Disable after end impulses allows you to set the maximum number of impulses the trigger can send. Selecting this checkbox will open up the option for you to set the number of impulses you want. Without this option set, the interval trigger will continue to send impulses at the set interval until the game ends or until you turn it off with a state event. Finally, select event filter is how you choose your impulse target. Next we have player event trigger. This is a bit more simple. This tool sends an impulse based on the actions of the rider. Let's open up the properties and have a look. Here we have only a few options. The one we are concerned with is type. The choices are crash, bailout, flip, lean, supercross final results, and track timeout. This means an impulse will be sent when the rider performs one of these actions. For example, let's set bailout to set off an explosion. Lastly, there is one more way to use an impulse, and that's from a checkpoint. We will talk more about this in the next lesson.